I feel very inadequate now, Steve. I got to be honest with you. Why is All that? Because right? you're sitting there with like the, like the Jay-Z, you know, microphone, <laughs> like spit thing, you know? And I've got these like crappy little ear pods in. And I'm, and I'm, I'm like, you know. But look, I'm using wired headphones though. That's like so old school. Okay. All right. Well, that, that I'll give you that. I, I will give you that. Like, where did you get those off? Like a jet blue plane or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> They're like $10. I, know, I, think those are white. I actually think those are white now. Yeah, no, these are like $10 marshmallow earbuds, but I love them. They're the only ones that stay in my ears. The, the AirPods won't stay in. All right. My well, ears listen. are weirdly shaped. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, the last time you were on, you had these giant ass, like, you know, what's happening, you know, 1970s earphones on. And I felt really inadequate about that. I should start using the big headphones. I feel like at least those are stylish and these are just practical without the style. Stylish? You think those are stylish? I don't I know. I guess people, I'm a I see people things. at the gym running with those and I'm like, aren't those weighing you down? Like, don't those weigh like six pounds? It's resistance um, training. I guess so. I guess so. So we got some people online, I guess, right? Um, yeah, we got some people in, in. They're, they're folding in. Uh, so quickly, um, let me, uh, first of all, thanks for, you know, filling uh, my, my students. So I, I, just for everybody who doesn't know me, you probably know who Steve is. Um, my name is Don McCauley. I'm the president and founder of a company called uh, Law Preview. Uh, which is a law school prep course uh, owned by Barbary. Um, and I'm not the, the, the big topic or, or uh, you know, uh, uh, of discussion tonight. You know, when, I, when I get, we have a, a blog on the Law Preview website um, that constantly is getting hits and questions about, um, about the LSAT. And I got to be honest with you, I have no idea. Um, so I, I thought I'd reach out to my good friend, uh, Steve Schwartz, who, uh, who runs LSAT Unplugged. Um, and, uh, he can, uh, answer some questions. So, but I don't want to, uh, I don't want to answer, you know, or introduce you, uh, you know, without, you know, without, with all your, with all your background. So go ahead and give a, give a quick background as to who you are, Steve. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Don. Thanks for having me and organizing this. So for those who don't know me, my name is Steve Schwartz. I run the LSAT blog. I also host the LSAT Unplugged YouTube channel and podcast. I've been teaching the LSAT for about 15 years now. My own LSAT journey was from a 152 to a 175, it took me about a year to get there. And my hope is that it won't take students out there studying nearly that long. My goal is to kind of ease the way. And so I have a ton of resources. And I'm, my big focus these days, of course, is the digital LSAT, which of course we'll get into a bit tonight. Right. And you're gonna do like a, a freestyle rap for us with that thing in front of your mic? Or no? Nobody yeah. wants to see, nobody wants to no? see that. No, are you sure, are you sure? <laughs> I'm sure. Some, a freestyle, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you three topics on the LSAT and you have to, you have to form a rap, how's that? Oh wow, freestyle right. improv, so, no, that's just no, not no, my thing, no, no. no. Uh, then I don't wanna do this interview, I figure that, okay. We'll save, that for the, save it for the I after party. I don't think party. you're qualified, I do not think you're qualified, all right? <laughs> um, all right, uh, so yeah, let, let's talk about the LSAT right now. I mean like, you know, honestly, you know, imagine uh, you have a student who, has no clue as to, uh, or they, they, they think they want to go to law school, um, you know, or they're, you know, they're leaning that way. Uh, and if they, you know, ask me, I will, you know, may, may disabuse them of that notion. Um, but if, uh, you know, if you have a kid who's, who wants to start, you know, exploring the law school admissions process, I, I guess the, the, the first part to start and think about is the LSAT, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. So the LSAT is, of course, the most important factor in the law school admission process. And just to frame this discussion a little bit, we're coming right now it's the week after the September LSAT this past Saturday. And so anyone who's just starting off now totally fresh, October, November LSATs, just a month or two months away, that's too soon. I wouldn't recommend taking the LSAT with only a month or two of prep. I would instead suggest minimum three to five months, aim to take it January at the earliest, maybe the spring, and then ideally look to apply next fall if they're starting off totally fresh. On the other hand, if they just took September, they could maybe retake in October or November. In addition, because they're at least that way, they're not starting from total scratch. They do have somewhat of a foundation. Right. As for how you get that foundation, that's a totally different thing. The biggest place I would start, of course, is the actual official LSAT prep tests published by LSAC. Right, 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 right. Now, so my the, the standard advice when I was when I was applying to law school is, you know, in terms of when to take the LSAT, it was like, you know, when you're ready. You know, um, is that does that still apply now that you have the? Because we last year we ran our video series and we interviewed um, Kelly Testy, who's the new uh, president of the LSAT uh, or L LSAC, I guess. And her big thing was that she brought the digital LSAT to you know to life. I guess um, you know, obviously before that, people were taking it like I did with a number two pencil. Um, have they made the transition over now 
to full di digital? Because I, I, I know that we're sort of spacing it in. Um, so has it, has it made its full transition? Yeah, it has. Actually, September, this past Saturday, was the first fully digital LSAT in North America. The July oh. LSAT was the transitional exam. Half the students got the paper, half got the digital. But now with September and beyond, in North America, meaning U.S. and Canada, it's totally digital, being administered on a tablet, a Microsoft Surface Go specifically, 10-inch tablet. There have been some tech issues that I'm hoping with time they will start to resolve more and more as time goes on. Right. But both July and September did have a few, a few minor tech snafus, but hopefully gotcha. they'll fix those going forward. Now, are the, are the scores, I know that is it the GMAT that gives you the score right away. Um, does that happen with the LSAT? Sadly, no. Sadly, no. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping with time they will. And they, they could at least give students the number they got correct, even if they don't give them the raw score conversion to right. a scaled score out of 180. They should be able to do that. And I think with time they will. Maybe they just don't want angry students yelling at proctors who are simply the guy who was hired to be there that weekend. Right. I don't know. <laughs> but hopefully with time, they'll be able to give students more information immediately. But for now, it still is approximately a three-week wait, as it always has been. Wow. Okay. Um, so let's, you know, we're taking the LSAT. It's going to be on a tablet. Uh, it, does that, first of all, does the, does the digital uh, approach change your stud, the way you study for it? It should quite a bit, actually, of course, because the content doesn't change at all. It's still one section of games, two sections of reasoning, one section of reading comp. The questions are identical in style, in format. But the difference is, of course, you're now taking it with this new interactive digital interface where you can only see one question at a time and you can't draw freehand on the tablet itself. You have to use LSAC's annotation tools, highlighting, underlining, and such. There are some good features, though. You can flag questions to come back to later and you can eliminate answer choices and they will kind of gray out on the screen. What that means for students prepping, of course, is that they can't only study out of books. They've got to do a few exams in the digital style. LSAC has made a few available on their website at familiar.lsac.org. Students can go on there and play around with the features. I recommend, of course, using a tablet. Doesn't have to be the Microsoft Surface Go specifically. Any tablet's fine. A Samsung, an iPad. You could buy a, an Amazon Fire for 150 bucks and return it afterwards if you decide that it's not for you, just to get a little bit of experience with it because it is not the same on a phone or a computer. Right, 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 right. Um, so the it's so funny that because we 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 polled uh admissions officers last year i don't know i don't know i don't think i don't think i shared the the uh the results of that poll with you but we posted them on our website I, and i forgive me if i didn't send it to you it was fascinating uh but one of the things that we we asked the the deans of admission uh was when you pick up a, a student's file um you know what's the first thing that you you look at and overwhelmingly like you know like overwhelmingly like above 80 percent like the lsat score Under, undergraduate gpa to some extent but really the lsat score um you know what do you why do you think it's such a big predict why why are why are schools so reliant on it as a predictor of, of law school um ability uh and maybe even success that's a great question don i, th I think in part there's a couple of things one of them is of course grade inflation there's a lot of grade inflation at a lot of colleges and universities right. and it's impossible. There, there are hundreds of colleges and universities in the country. You can't possibly know the details on every single one, including all the different undergraduate majors. And then, of course, some majors, it's easier to get an A than others. Like computer science might be tougher than sociology or English or what have you, something in the humanities, right? Right. And some professors are easier than others. I mean, I had one professor who just gave everybody A's because he didn't believe in grades. Definitely a good class to take for law school, but, no there, <laughs> but, but there's, of course, that qu there, there's something questionable there. The LSAT is the truly single objective measure of students' ability. No grade inflation possible, no variation possible. LSAC, they're, they're, they're wizards over there with their knowledge of statistics. These test forms really are identical to each other in every possible way. And so that's the single reliable factor they can look at. Plus, it has a strong demonstrated correlation with first year law school grades, which of course are related to bar passage rates and right. law schools care very much about par bar passage rates. Right, right, right. Um, so in terms of other tests that are becoming more and more, uh, you know, at least allowed, but not, not necessarily, I don't think favored, um, in terms of the GRE, 
Uh, and then what other, there was a, there was a recent article about um, schools allowing another test this year. Um, and I forget which one it was. It, it might've been, it might've been the GMAT. Really? Uh, that a couple, a couple schools. Yeah, no. And this is recent. I'm, I'm talking like in the last two months, I saw an article about um, a, a, a law school or two tinkering with the idea of allowing uh, the GMAT as a, um, as a, uh, as an entrance exam. You know, first off, you know, in, in terms of a law school, I know from, you know, the work that I do, that they have to have some kind of a gatekeeping function um, to make sure that, you know, there are not a lot of bad actors out there in terms of law schools, allowing students in who can't complete the three-year curriculum. And, you know, to do that is to sentence somebody to, you know, you know a lifetime of, you know, basically owning a mortgage without a house, you know, in terms of the student loans. Um, so why do you think, I'm assuming that you've done some research, at least on the GRE, um, you know, in terms of the comparison uh, between the LSAT, uh, you know, what, what's your experience between people taking the GRE versus the LSAT or, or maybe even some people who take both? Yeah, there's something I, I've been quite curious about in the past couple of years is, of course, you know, Harvard was the big name that took, yeah. started taking the GRE and then other schools followed suit. And, you know, I was kind of, it kind of frustrated me a little bit just because they, the ETS, the people who make the GRE, they haven't truly demonstrated, at least in my opinion, that the GRE is a valid predictor of anything, first year law right. school grades, bar passage rates, what have you. But, and schools, schools in the top 14, anyone they're going to admit is going to do perfectly fine. No one getting into Harvard Law is at risk of reasonably like, likely to fail, fail the bar. Mm -hmm. But the GRE itself, what is it really testing? It's, it's like the SAT. Now, of course, law school applicants just want to know, will they get in with this? I've talked to a handful of admission officers about this, and what they tell me is that they're taking less than 5% of applicants with GRE scores specifically. And those people usually have something unique in their background, right. probably a ton of impressive work experience that where the law school just wants this person because of where they're going to go after law school. But if you're, you're, if you're the typical applicant straight out of college, working as a paralegal, they want to see that you're serious about law school and taking the LSAT and doing well on it is the best way to indicate that. Right. I, mean, I think that also, it, it also sort of, even though it started with Harvard, um, you know, it, 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 it picked up the momentum because law schools were really just fighting for the brain drain of everybody going to business school or you know, other graduate programs rather than law school uh, after the economic crunch. Um, and, you know, for quite a few years after that, where, you know, law firms weren't hiring as many associates, uh, you know, partners at, you know, the largest law firms in the world are like, wow, we could do a lot more with a lot less sometimes. Um, and, you know, why does hiring Steve Schwartz, another associate, you know, how is that going to help pay the, pay the mortgage on my Hamptons house, you know? Um, so let's not hire him. Um, but I guess now that the, the hiring has come back, I think that, um, that schools are, you know, like you said, I, I would even be shocked it's 5%. Um, I would say, you know, from my conversations with uh, deans of admissions, and even we actually did a poll of students. Uh, we do a poll every year called, you know, class of 2022, 2021, what makes you tick? Sort of like figuring out who they are and, and what they did. And I think that the results of that poll came back at like 2% of the kids who took, um, took the GRE. Uh, and overwhelmingly, it was like, hey, I already took it. And if I can apply to law school with it, like, why not? You know, let me, let me throw in an application. Um, That's kind of what I law schools are going for in a way, because they want to, they want to look more selective. And so mm -hmm. if they can solicit more applications and right. decrease the percentage accepted, then that looks better for them in the rankings. So they, they right. say, send us your applications. Wait, give you're us your talking about, hold on. You're talking about something that doesn't exist though. Yield protection doesn't exist, right? Like they don't, there's, there's schools that, I'm joking. Uh, you know, in terms of, in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of the, that's what you're speaking about, right? Yield yeah. protection in terms of the, uh, the number of applicants that, that apply and then the number of applicants that they ultimately accept. And then obviously those who accept their offer, right? right? Going into the, uh, the U.S. News and World Report rankings, which is a completely, you know, another part of the conversation. Let's get back to the LSAT though. All right. Sure. Um, you're me, uh, or you're, you're a student who, who, who is serious about going to law school. Um, and, uh, you know, has to tackle the LSAT, how much time do you budget for that? Like how much time would you, your son or daughter wants to go to law school next year? Yeah, you know, what would you, what advice would you give them from beginning to end? So let's say if they're in college or they're working mm -hmm. and they're studying for the LSAT on the side, I would say put in 
ideally 15 to 20 hours per week consistently and build the foundation first. Get one of those books of LSAT exams. They sell them in books of 10 on Amazon for about 20 bucks each. Mm -hmm. Get one of the recent ones administered in the past five, 10 years and build the foundation. I recommend a five-step approach to studying. I call it the laser approach, learning, accuracy, sections, exams, and review. Learning is the theory, just studying the textbook, the different question types, getting a sense of what the LSAT involves. Accuracy is doing individual questions by type. Sections is 35 minute timed sections to work on your pacing. E is for endurance, doing full length five section exams and then review. How many of those would you do? I would do at least 10. 10 full length timed exams under realistic test day like conditions. Students often wonder, why did my test day score drop from my practice? Because the practice wasn't realistic enough. So really be really strict with yourself and do at least 10 so that test day is like just another practice. Gotcha. Um, the, you know, it, it's, have you been following, I'm, I'm assuming you've been following the uh, Malcolm Gladwell's revisionist history. Yes. I, I listened uh, to those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, so when he interviews um, Dan Edmonds and, and John Katzman, other people that I know in your industry, um, you know, the advice they give is it's not about getting the right answer. It's about finding the best answer quickly. Um, and is that sort of what, is that sort of the idea behind the, you know, the, the realistic timing and, or, you know, making sure that you are doing these things in a time pressured approach rather than you know, basically lazily going through the book and understanding the questions, trying to get the right answer, obviously. Um, but not doing it in a disciplined quick way. I think that, and I, I had my issues with that podcast and we can get into that if you want, but I would I will, love to. Yeah. yeah, sure. But I will say that they were correct that the time constraint is a major part of wake, well, what makes the LSAT difficult. And mm-hmm. on reading comprehension, especially, it is about picking the best of the worst. The correct answer will not be worded in an ideal fashion, the way that you would have constructed it yourself, right. but it is technically correct. Gotcha. Um, so when we led this up, and I, I do want to get back to the uh, to the podcast because I what, oh, actually why not? What what what, are, what were your issues with it? I think that there is something to be said for being able to solve the questions quickly, and I felt like mm-hmm. Malcolm Gladwell was saying the tortoise versus the hare. The to- you know, let's root for the tortoises. Get rid of the time constraint. You know, loosen the time constraint. It's one thing to get the questions correct. It's another thing to get them correct under timed conditions and. Lawyers, a lot of them do bill by the hour. And whether you're in a courtroom or not, there is value in being able to do something quickly. And, you know, the noodle guys, Katzman and them, I mean, I think that they they were saying, like, you don't have to, don't don't actually try to understand what you're reading to a certain extent. They were saying things like that. And I was like, don't understand it. Like, I get that you you kind of want to skim a little bit because of the time constraint, but you should still try to walk away with the main idea. Right, right. Well, so you're speaking to a tortoise. All right. Um, and I was not somebody who could parlay a, what would you, a 152 to 175 on the LSAT like you did, uh, which I have to get back to, um, to, to figure out exactly how you did that. Um, the laser approach, I'm assuming is the foundation for that, but there's gotta be some other things that you did. Um, but I, I will also say, you know, having been the tortoise, um, and, you know, also training a lot of tortoises, uh, you know, where I really did, you know, what, what resonated with me about that, with me about that podcast was, you know, even though you do want your act, your doctor or your your lawyer to um, to uh, move quickly, right? You want them to be right, you know. And you know, having been at a, at a large law firm for a number of years, you know, uh, prior to starting Law Preview, you know, one of the things that you know sort of you know frustrated me was that you were rewarded for almost inefficiency, right? It was Steve, don't give me what you think is the right answer. Give me what you know is the right answer. Um, and, you know, when your reputation is trading on every case that you work on, right, every matter, you know, both inside and outside of the firm, um, you want that lawyer to, you know, understand every word that you say. So, like, in terms of, you know, the LSAT as a predictor for, you know, training our best lawyers in the world, I, I can almost, I can understand that you wouldn't want your your top lawyers in the country to race through an issue. Actually, none of them would. Um but, you know, for this one test, it's, it's just frustrating, I guess, for, you know, 
at least from his approach, I, you know, looking at it, saying this is how we're choosing the nation's best lawyers is by how well they perform on this time pressured exam. Um, I, I thought it was fascinating. I really did. I thought it, you know, Bill Henderson, another guy that I do know in the industry, uh, he teaches at University of Indiana. I've sat on a couple of boards with him. Um, and I knew that he was doing that in terms of giving extended time on his, you know, his, his first year and his upper level of classes, uh, the exams. And he's like, the quality of the exam answer goes up, um, which is great, you know. Um, but I'm also not a fan of the 24-hour take-home exam. I think that that's just cruel, you know, in law school. Uh, but let's get back to you. Uh, so you, you went from the 150s to 175. How is that even possible? Because I, you know, all the reading that I've done or all the, the people that I've ever spoken to is, you know, in terms of re retaking the LSAT, you know, the chances of you moving up even five points because it's such a big jump in percentile um, is, is not very great. You know, and I say not very great because I have no control of math. Uh, and that's why I went to law school. Um, so I, I would imagine it's infant, you know, infinitesimal um, in terms of, you know, in terms of the size of, but how did you do it? How did you jump that, that big, that big jump? Well, a couple of things I'll say first off that the average person who retakes does not go up that much, maybe a couple right. points. And I imagine that's because maybe they, they booked the exam. They were busy with college, busy with work, busy, busy with family. They kind of procrastinated studying, didn't do that much. And then test day rolls around and suddenly, oh, it's a week away. I better crack the books. And they don't do that much. That's right. probably why most people don't go up on retakes. As right. for my own personal story, my score increase was largely because like a lot of students, I did no studying before taking a cold diagnostic. And the results, of course, were discouraging. It's like taking right. a, a test in a foreign language. Of course, you're not going to do well. You don't know anything yet. Right. All that tells you is that I don't know the LSAT but it can be learned. And it is a test of pattern recognition. And for me especially, I was never a math person. Of course, I was a pre-law. So right. naturally, I bombed games. Games are not math, but they do relate in some way. Right. I didn't know how to diagram. I didn't know what they were really asking for. I didn't know how to make inferences. I didn't know the contrapositive barely. And so it was natural that that section would just be a big fat zero, practically, right. line guessing. Now, the LSAT is a test of pattern recognition. That's really what it's all about on every section. And so how do people deal with the time constraint? It's because when you're looking at a new question, you're not really solving that question. You're solving all the questions like it you've ever done in the past. Than before, yeah. So you're relating it back, even subconsciously somewhat. There aren't that many re methods of reasoning on the LSAT. There aren't that many new things under the sun. They reuse old stuff all the time. Right. And that gets to their ability to equate the exam pretty well, right? Exactly. Exactly. Right. So that, and that, you know, just for the audience, can you explain to the audience what the difference between scaling, equating, and you know, doing a curve is? Yeah, sure. So test equating is the process by which LSAC ensures that any new LSAT test form, meaning new four section test LSAT prep test, will relate to all the previous ones, so that a, a one seventy on the October LSAT is considered identical to a one seventy on September and a 170 on March and June and so on, that all tests are roughly equal. Now, the, a, curve, a curved exam is like when you go in for a final in college and you want to sabotage the guy next to you because if he does worse, then you do better. That sort right. of thing, where there's competition amongst people in the same pool. The right. LSAT doesn't want everyone backstabbing each other, so they kind of equate it all behind the scenes. That's part of why it takes three weeks to get your score back because they want to make sure that pe people performed as expected for them to scale from a raw score, which is like, maybe you got 10 questions wrong out of 100, that would equate to roughly a 170 out of 180. Right. Now, let me ask you this. So in terms of, you know, in my day, you know, the idea was you take the LSAT only once, right? That law schools were averaging scores. Um, that's not the case anymore. Um, Correct, they, yeah. They take their, you know, why penalize themselves, I guess they thought. Um, just like colleges will take the, the highest score. I don't know if they, they, I don't think they super score them, um, but like they do, like some colleges will, uh, but they will take the best score now. Uh, the overwhelming majority of the law schools, I, I don't want to speak for all of them, right? Yeah, pretty, um, much, pretty much all of them. Yeah, this, that change happened in 2006. Now the right. American Bar Association only requires the highest score to be submitted. Gotcha. Now in terms of, you know, with that, is there, what are the advantages or disadvantages of, or and when should you cancel? your score, you know, in terms of cancel your test. 
Yeah, you know, I kind of wish they would get rid of the canceling option. I think it creates so much unnecessary stress for students. And yeah, if right. something went horribly wrong, like you miss bubble something which isn't really possible on digital now anyway. Right. But if you like totally bombed an entire section or just blanked out, had a panic attack, got sick, then and you know that you did terribly, then then you might want to cancel. But otherwise, if you have that vague sense of unease that things could have gone a little bit better and you, you didn't do as well as you could have on this one game and later you figured out a better way to solve it after the fact, that would, that's the sort of thing that would be nice to happen. But just retake. Just retake. Right. They don't want your explanations on an addendum of how you could have done a few points better, but you know, your dog got sick and you ate, ate your LSAT book and whatnot, right? Like just retake right, right, right. it. And now with nine, 10 tests a year, practically every month, there's really no excuse not to retake if you think you could do better. And that's where I think gotcha. the canceling naturally for me leads into retakes. Because if it didn't go well, just take it again. And especially this fall, you've got October and you've got November ahead of you. Plus even January is still okay. Right, right. So in terms of the writing sample on the, on the digital LSAT, how are they handling that? Yeah, so that's actually a, a big format change. It's no longer on test day itself. Instead, it's on your own time whenever you want. It still is time. It still is 35 minutes, but you're not doing it at the test center anymore. Instead, you're doing it from the comfort of your own home or your library, wherever you want to bring your laptop, and you just complete it later. You have up to one year to complete it after your test administration, but law schools will not release your score. Uh, the LSAC will not release your score to law schools until you complete it. Gotcha. So you're going on to a portal that once you start typing, it starts the time clock. Is that what it is? Exactly. You go on LSAC's site, you're logging in, and once you, you know, they, make, they help you get your tech set up appropriately. And once you click start, timer starts, and you're off to the races. All right. how, like, in all honesty, how important is the written, is the written portion of the LSAC? And, it's, and, yeah. it's still not that important, but yeah. it's a little bit more important than it used to be because they can actually read what you're typing now. Back when it was handwritten, they uh, weren't going to bother sifting through all your, all your terrible <laughs> handwriting. Everyone, nobody has good handwriting anymore. But I was actually talking to the dean of UCLA, and he was saying how like, now it's wonderful for him because he can just quickly skim them, and it's all typed. It's perfect. Right, so right. maybe they will look at it a little bit more, but still, it's mostly for people where they have concerns over their writing abilities, if they bombed English class or they're a non-native speaker, they want to make sure that you're proficient. Right. It's funny. I also spoke to a couple of... Uh, we work really closely with our, you know, a couple scholarship programs that we run through the law schools uh, for students to come and take our program, the law preview program. And they, um, they, what the hell was that? That's like the largest mug I've ever seen. I know. I, I go what pretty you, hard. By the way, what are you tea. drinking? What are you drinking? This is, this is a turmeric chai tea. So fancy. It's so fancy. I yeah. I Only the realize. best for my LSAT classes. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize. So they, um, but a lot of the deans of admission use it as a check against the personal statement um, mm -hmm. that they want to make sure that, you know, Steve's writing style is comparable to what he's submitted as the, you know, on your personal statement. Otherwise, maybe he didn't write it. Um, exactly. Which is a, you know, something that I was like, oh, wow, that's an interesting use of, of that, that tool, which I never thought, you know, in, in my day when I was taking the LSAT, they're like, ah, oh, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. Um, and you're right, probably because like most law school admission teams wouldn't sit there and try to read through the response. Yeah, know? they're only spending like five minutes on an application anyway, writing sample gets what, 20 seconds? Right, right. So, um, so now, okay, we've, we've taken the LSAT, all right? We think we can do better. Maybe we cancel our score according to your advice. You know, you know if, if you walk out feeling queasy, you took the LSAT. That, that's really just a figment of, you know, living the life of somebody who's taken the LSAT. Um, for whatever reason you want to retake, what's the best way to prepare to re for, for a retake? Yeah, well, so you want to think about what you're going to do differently next time around. If there's a resource you didn't get that you maybe should have or thought about or considered, this is the time to do that. If you skimped on LSAT books and didn't want to get enough exams, don't skimp on them. That's the best investment you'll ever make. Go get another couple of books of exams so that you're arming yourself with the best materials possible. And then focus on your weak areas. Take more time to practice tests. In, you know, increase the depth of your review process. Really analyze where your misunderstandings are stemming from. Because like I said, it's a test of pattern recognition. These things repeat. If there's a question you got wrong last week and you don't fully understand it, it's going to come up again in a different form in a future exam. 
and you right. don't want to get it wrong then too. So right. Learn from your mistakes. Yeah. A lot of it's like Pavlov's dogs. Once you see it, once you get a, you know, accustomed to it, you know, you know, you don't want to go for the wrong answer every time that they always throw out there at you. Um, you know, it's sort of like fault forcing yourself to stop drooling and say, okay, wait, hold on. I've recognized my salivary glands are going, something's wrong here. I want to go for A, but I know it can't be A. It's got to be one of the other choices. Um, is that, so is that what you're doing on LSAT Unplugged? Like, how are you, in terms of your students, when you talk about your students, what kind of course offerings are you, you are you providing? Is it all online? Do you do in class? Yeah, it's all online. It's all online. I have like, I have live online video, ma like master classes. I have Q and A's. I walk through student written explanations. Master class. You sound very fancy. What's yeah, a master yeah. class? It's when we really get in depth with the students' review processes so that we can see what tricks are they uniquely falling for. I actually have students write out their own explanations for questions they got wrong. So we analyze what tricks and traps that student is uniquely prone to falling for so they don't make the same mistake again. So is this a one-on-one -on -one thing or is this a, is it a group thing that you're doing? It's a, it's a group thing. Okay. So you're actually doing, you know, there's actual feedback in terms of, you know, are they on, are they on camera with you, you know, in the room, with, basically in the chat room, I guess, with other, with other students where other students are looking at their responses or are you just going through talking about one person's response to them? I have two types of programs I'll do. One program within the courses is where students will submit their explanations in advance. And uh -huh. then we put, I'll throw it up on the whiteboard and we'll analyze it together as a class. And then I have group coaching where students actually get on camera with me and we talk oh, cool. through their problems. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, it looks like we have some questions here. So in terms of other, you know, before we do, but you know, in terms of other strategies for retakes, because I saw one student was talking about, you know, prepping for the uh, retaking for the October test. Um, what, uh, you know, what other strategies, like what is the most common, what's the most common pitfall you find other than the kid who waits until the last you know, week before he's like, oh, I should crack this book. I think the biggest mistake, honestly, aside from not spending enough time, is not spending enough time on the review process specifically. Students right. just take exam after exam. They measure the results. They get obsessive with like charts and spreadsheets and all that. But they just, after they take one exam, they move on to the next, hoping to get that, you know, that randomized reward of getting a higher score. When in right, reality, right. The, the true value in doing an exam comes from getting questions wrong, finding out what you struggled with. If you work through 100 problems and you get, 15 wrong and guess on another 10, that's 25 to review. Right. And that's where the understanding, the gains in understanding come from is when you can review all of those 25 so that you don't make those same mistakes again. Right. And it's so funny. I mean, that, that logic or that, that, that um, pedagogy, I guess, continues over to actually to the law school. Uh, because when we prep students to really kick ass the first year, um, you know, the biggest thing is really taking as many practice exams, even though there's no chance you'll see those questions again. Um, it's getting familiar with the professor's writing style, the way they test a lot of the questions, types that they're asking, um, and many of them are coachable. Um, so I agree, you know, once you, once you sit there and say, oh, I got this wrong or I got this right, um, let me move on and see if I can get more right on the next one. It doesn't do you much help unless you're actually sitting there saying, why did I get this wrong? And, you know, like any good law student, you know, the big thing that, you know, that will go through and course through the rest of your life is you will become a, the most skeptical person you'll ever meet in your life. And you'll be constantly asking why, why, you know, why should I believe Steve Schwartz? You know, like why, you know, um, you know, why should you, you know, do this? Why are they asking this? Why is the court saying this? Why are they using this logic rather than, you know, using a four part test They're using a three part test like other courts. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it obviously plays into the same, you know, vein with, students who want to excel on the LSAT. Uh, do you want to take a couple questions? Yeah, sure. Let's do it. All right. So we have one uh, here from Brittany. Oh, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you read it off then because my, my vision is not that great right now. All right. Okay. Um, Brittany's saying- <laughs> Oh, yeah, there it is. All right. Brittany's saying she took the LSAT in January. Can they use her writing section from that test or should she submit a different one? She's taking it again in October. So once you've done the writing sample, you don't have to do another one ever again. Okay. Even if you've done the old paper LSAT, you did a writing sample for that, you don't need to do a new one, but you can if you like. And I think if you did a paper one where we're written by hand, it could be good to do a digital one just so they have a, an example they can actually read and make use of. But once you've done a digital writing, I wouldn't bother doing one again. Gotcha. What about, um, how long does the, the new digital LSAT last? Is it still five years? Yeah, it's still five years. The score reports are still good for five years. Gotcha. Gotcha. 
Well, Brittany seems very happy. Hooray. I'm, we're, we're happy to make you uh, uh, very, very happy, Brittany. All right. Um, do you have any specific rec uh, this is from Allison. Do you have any uh, specific recommendations for the prep books? Now you mentioned the the LSAT uh, real tests uh, that you can pull off of at, at Amazon or the LSAT website. Um, but what what other books do you recommend? Yeah, so the LSAT prep tests are of course the the most important. Other than that, I think any of the well-reviewed ones would be fine as long as it's using real LSAT questions and it's published by right. a company that specializes exclusively in the LSAT. Like you don't want to use LSAT for dummies or something like that where they're using fake problems that contain mistakes and errors and typos. And the simulated LSAT questions rarely ever come close to the real thing. And right. if they contain mistakes, then you're just confusing yourself even more. Right. Um, do you, I know the Bible series is um, you know, from uh, uh, the folks over at Power Score is a, is a popular one. Have you read it? Have you reviewed it? Yeah, I think the Power Score Bibles are a really good resource. Yeah, 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 I would yeah, definitely I recommend those. Yeah. Um, all right, that's, geez, what happened to all our questions? I thought we had four, but I guess it's just four comments from some from the, from the same people. I guess your volume was down a little bit, Steve, so I don't know. Oh, was it? Yeah, maybe, let me see. Maybe that giant, maybe that giant uh, you know, uh, <laughs> splatter thing in front of your mic. Uh, see, maybe you're, you're a little too high tech for us. Just for, just for show, really. It doesn't actually do anything. <laughs> Are you ready for your freestyle uh, rap? Are you? No. Dude, it's not happening? No, I'm dude. having tech issues, Don. I have to sign what? off. <laughs> what? What? I, I was going to bring Jay-Z in with that thing and, uh, and rap battle you about the LSAT. Well, I am in Brooklyn um, here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll let them know. Um, maybe next time. So uh, let's see. There, there's an LSAT every September. I'm targeting the school, uh, law school for fall of 2021. I'm trying to figure out a study plan that will utilize all of my prep time. Uh, so that's a good question. I mean, like, so you, you've got about a year, uh, you're about two years out, um, you know, in terms of uh, start date. Uh, you know, this this person, Stephen, would want to uh, be applying probably, you know, obviously next September. Uh, if you have a full year to wait on um, on taking the LSAT, how would you manage your time? Well, that's you, awesome. you mentioned You mentioned, what, you said 15, 15 hours a week, right? Um is that the number? I yeah, so I would say 15, 20 hours a week. And obviously, they vary. Okay. if you're sitting over the course of an entire year, you could right. dampen that down a bit. But for someone like this who's got a year to study or a year before they apply, I would say aim to take the LSAT in the spring and then retake it in the fall if you need to. You, know, you could aim to take it, we're in September now, you could take it in March, then potentially retake it in July. And then if you're still not good, go for September. But I was, so I would really aim to go for a six month timeline and see how that plays out. Right. In terms of budgeting, like how would you, would you say, look, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to kick ass and master the reading comprehension section. Um, and then once I've done that, then I will turn my attention to logic games or you know, how would you budget your time in terms of studying for different parts of the exam? Yeah, I definitely like the divide and conquer approach. I like focusing on one section, mastering mm -hmm. that moving on to the next, but I actually, I actually start with games because games are the scariest at first for most students, but they right. actually are the most learnable and perfectable. And so once you tackle that mysterious beast of games, then you get a big morale confidence boost. You can go in and tackle the others. And then once you move on to logical reasoning, still cycle in games to stay fresh, then cycle in reading comp while working on the others as well. But I'd start with one to, at the beginning. Okay. Uh, so I, we have a question from Brian. Is it Brian here uh, or Bram? I can't always say. Um, but it's about, you know, it's, I guess he's, there's a rumor that the logic game section um, has become harder uh, than in the past. Is that true? Yeah, so September, she, I think she, Brandy's referring to September. Okay. LSAT. Brandy, so I'm sorry. Brandy. It, you got, got cut off for me too. Yeah, so, yeah. so September's LSAT this past Saturday was, did have a notoriously difficult logic game section and a lot of students were up in arms about it, very upset, surprised by it. And she's asking, is this the, the new normal? And why did this happen? I think LSAC is always looking to throw curveballs. They're always looking to ramp up the difficulty of the exam because people are prepping more than they used to. It's gotten more competitive. And so they want to kind of normalize the curve based on, in response to students. And so right. I do think games will get harder over time as they have been. They want to challenge students who are trying to copy someone else's technique or use too regimented an approach. And so the way to counteract that as a student is, just be really good at games and do all the tough ones that have ever appeared. I have a list on my site and I can also email it out to everyone afterwards of just the, all the tough games over the years 
where I would really recommend focusing if you're looking to perfect them. And there's no reason you can't do all of those before even October. Right. So just so uh, the students know, because uh, I'm going to post this as a video later on, uh, what site, where would they find that list on your site? So this is on my site, the LSAT blog. I have an article tied, titled like weird curveball LSAT logic games. Right. Okay. Um, and I mean, is it a possibility that, that that really hard section was the experimental? Are they still doing the experimental? They are still doing experimentals, but what Brandy's referring to is a real, the real scored section. Damn. Sorry, Brandy. All right. I would, I would have like, I would have said like, well, maybe the optimist in me is like, yeah, that's the, that was the experimental section. Don't worry too much about it. But I guess maybe you have to worry a little bit. Um, so I guess the, you mentioned before about doing some uh, kind of rudimentary, uh, you know, uh, you know, highlighting and underlying uh, on the digital tablet, right? Um, and there's a question about uh, how do you diagram if you if you need to diagram uh, the logic a logic game. Yeah, sure. So to be clear, the digital LSAT has underlining and highlighting features, but yeah. I don't love them. The stylus is not that responsive, or the tablet's not that responsive to the stylus that they give you when you're- Did you actually take it? Did you actually take it on the-, on the No, I, ha I haven't done the digital personal. I've only okay. done it on my, on my own. But gotcha. the stylus that they give you is not that responsive to the tablet. Not that, that doesn't work that well with the tablet. So- Gotcha. You can't, you can use your finger if you want, but even then it's not that precise. And so I would instead just use the scratch paper on the side. You can use a pencil or a pen and they give you a booklet of about 12 to 14 pages, eight and a half by 11. So just do all your drawing there. And you okay. kind of do have to go back and forth a little bit, but you can simulate that using your, even a prep book, have your book, have separate scratch paper and don't write on the book magic. Right. It's that simple. And you were doing the same thing before. I mean, they gave you scratch paper before when you were taking the written exam. They actually right? didn't. They, you had to use it oh, in the booklet. Oh, okay. Yeah. You, did it, you did your, that's right. You did it in the booklet, right? Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, there's a question um, here about taking the LSAT multiple times. Uh, and I guess it's, you know, you know, common, you know, urban myth is that it's frowned upon uh, by taking it too many times. Is there an ideal time? Is that, you know, in terms of your experience with admissions, uh, law school admissions, um, is that true? Well, you're obviously taking it once and getting a 180 is way better than taking it five times and only getting a 180 on the fifth time. But if you can improve, then it's worth retaking. They'd rather see a higher score, even if it means retaking. And there is a limit on that. I think six or seven times, it looks still like a little too much, but taking it even three or it four like times. It's a belt with suspenders. That's the kind of attorney <laughs> I want to, that's the kind of guy I want to hire. You know, it's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do everything I possibly can. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I think three or four times is totally fine. And gotcha. if you can improve even a couple points, it is worth it. And you can also postpone if you're not ready or withdraw if you're not ready. And so if the test week rolls around and you're not feeling that great, that doesn't have to be a take for you. Law schools right. will, will never even know that you were registered. If you they won't know that, right? They will see the canceled score though, right? Well, they or see, they, they, they'll see that you canceled. I don't know if they see the score. They see, right. cancel they see cancellations. Nobody ever sees the score of a canceled exam. But if you withdraw before the exam or postpone before the exam, they will never even know that you were registered. So that does not count as a take. Right. In terms of like retaking, I'm just wondering, now that it's being offered so many times um, via digital, um, is, is, a month, is a month really enough? To say like, okay, I didn't, I took it in September. I want to retake it in October. Is that really enough? You know, assuming the average person is, you know, you know, either, I mean, maybe if they're a senior in college um, where you have more control over your schedule um, and you really can buckle down and study really hard for a month. But imagine, you know, the average age of people going to law school now has, you know, increased dramatically. Um, most of those folks are probably working. Um, you know, is a month really enough or would, what would you recommend? Again, this is not you. This is, you know, this is your kid that you're advising uh, about retaking the LSAT. Yeah, no, that's, that's a fair point. A month is not that much time to be fair. And of course, if someone waits the three weeks to get their score back, then they only have one week to actually study. Right. Not a great idea, of course. And so if September didn't go well, definitely keep studying. Don't take any, don't maybe take a couple days off, but really try to just buckle down and focus. But the nice thing is that you also have November. Like you could just take September if it didn't go great, do November. do November instead. That way you have two right. months, which should be more time. And if you focus, plus you already have all the previous studying you've done under your belt, 
you might not need that much more. There also is an element of luck. LSAT scores have a, have a score band. Of wait, wait, hold on, hold on. Uh, there's an element of luck? There is, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. How come I didn't get lucky in the LSAT? <laughs> well, I didn't, yeah, say good, I, didn't say, I didn't say good luck necessarily. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> There's an element, you know, there's, there's a three and a half point score band on either end. So someone whose true aptitude is a 160, they might get a 160, they might get a 157, they might get a 164. Ah. And yes, it's a totally valid exam. There just, there is that margin on either end. And so if your true score is a 160, but September went poorly, you got a 157, you could just stay fresh and get a 164 the next time without improving understanding at all. And or, if at you got, 160, or at least a 160. At least a right? 160. And if you right. actually study and actually improve your understanding, you could do even better than that. So, right. And because law schools don't average scores and only take the highest, there's really not much downside other than your LSAT registration fee and having to spend your weekend studying instead of partying. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, in terms of, yeah, let's just talk about the cost of it. Um, in terms of a, the cost of you know, taking the LSAT for somebody who hasn't explored it. Uh, what's the cost? So it costs two hundred dollars to register. Okay, and, and that's then there's just also, a one. That's a one-time shot at it. That's so that's that's for each take. So if you took it three times, six hundred dollars. They do have a fee waiver program for those who demonstrate financial need. I recommend submitting that early because they take a while to process it, but that can help you save some money. Where they make their money though, really, is on the fees. Like if you postpone, there's a fee to postpone to a later test date. If you, if you register late, there's a fee for that. And so you want to go on their site, be on top of all the deadlines, maybe add them to your calendar so that right. you're not paying up the, up the nose for all these different little things. Gotcha. Do you, is there, do you have a calendar on your website that, you know, that, that might be a nice little feature is the ICS calendar that you just download. Oh, that's um, a good idea. Uh, uh, excuse me. I'm full of great ideas. All right. I'm going to write more. this down. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I invented the iPhone too. I just didn't execute on it. <laughs> right. Uh, that was my problem. I, damn, was, I had this Palm Pilot and a, a flip phone. And I was like, wouldn't it be great if we combine these things? <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, that would be a cool thing is, you know, obviously is to keep everybody on task because they, those fees do. I, I know that having looked at it, you know, the later you go, the more expensive it gets. And there's no reason to pay it, you know, take that. Does it, is the same thing applying now in terms of those deadlines with the, with the digital exam having so often? Yeah, there still are all the same deadlines and Rolling. associated fees and such. And because there's nine or 10 test dates, LSAC is raking in the dough on all those fees. And we had a comment from Brittany here saying, apply for the fee waiver. If you get denied, you can appeal the fee waiver. That's a great point. And you can show extra documentation if they deny you the first time. It is worth retrying. Gotcha. And we have Cynthia yeah. saying that she appealed. It was approved. So definitely worth doing. We have a couple people who benefited there. Yeah, for, for a couple hundred bucks, that's, uh, that's definitely, I mean, it would pay for at least, you know, a half a, half a mug of tea for him. Right. Uh, in terms of you know, your organic chai, whatever the hell you're drinking tea. Um, all right. Uh, so last, last bit of advice before we let these folks go. We've kept them on the line for about 50 minutes. Uh, what, what would be your overall best tip for the LSAT, all right, and the thing that you've seen students do that is a – absolute must no no like yeah you know, what is the biggest pitfall that most students see oh wow okay so i guess i've said a lot already but one thing i haven't said is that these these cold diagnostics that students take they can be really discouraging at first so don't let your diagnostic score hang over you like a dark cloud of despair it does not define you it's only a starting point and you sound like oprah you yeah, know? I know. I'm trying to be it's all like, motivational. Rah, all rah, yeah. go, it's, go. All that, it's all that tea I've been drinking. <laughs> but it doesn't, it, must... it doesn't define you. It's just a starting point. I know that you can improve significantly from there. Just have a systematic plan of attack. And that's what that laser approach I mentioned is. Learning, accuracy, sessions, exams, review. It's what my study plans are all based upon. The month-by-month -month ones, the day-by-day -day ones on my site where I lay out exactly what to be doing, how to use the LSAT exams, how to use the, the LSAT prep tests, the theory, the articles on my site. I pull it all together for you to make it easy to use. As for the absolute no-no, I would say hmm, absolute no-nos. Spend less time on the message boards online. They're, they're, instead of reading about other people studying and the stories they make up about what they've done, just focus on your own study process. Don't get wrapped up in what they're doing. Just focus on yourself. Hit the books. It's funny. One of the... Uh, so we're actually doing a, a law school admissions roundtable um, where we've got uh, 10 law school admissions deans 
who are basically answering a bunch of questions and you know, uh, you know for that we get constantly about the law school admissions process um, and you know based on that survey that we did last year of law school admissions deans in terms of like you know what part of the you know uh, the uh, you know question do you read first what demo what what Democrat should, what, what political uh, party are you most affiliated with which you know overwhelmingly Democrat um, but the uh, you know um, the uh, the one thing they kept saying was that oh shoot I can now I'm like drawing a blank on your your last piece of advice because it was it was playing off of that I was seeing the message boards and focusing yes, on your yes. study. so they were saying that exactly that it's like you know you know in terms of the number of people the, the admissions deans who look at that those message boards it, it was like seventy five percent and then the follow up question that was um, how often are they inaccurate uh, when they reference your school? And it was like plus 90%, you know, like they, they, they don't pay, don't, for some reason, I guess, you know, if it's on the internet, it's not, it's not always true. Um, well, know, Russia, Russia's on those boards too. Well, listen, you know, I mean, you know, there, there might be, <laughs> I, don't even start me. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, but listen, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to, you know, to clarify this. I, I know that the digital LSAT has been, you know, the you know there's been a lot of questions uh surrounding it um and uh you know this i hopefully made folks feel a lot better uh about you know approaching the lsat and ultimately going to law school no thanks tom this was fantastic thank you for the chat and the conversation thanks for having me and looking no, forward to no, getting this out for everyone yeah awesome dude thank you very much uh hopefully we'll do this again because I, I really enjoyed chatting you're like i'll be like the gail to your oprah how's that Perfect. And then we can flip the script right. as always. <laughs> All right. Take it easy, man. All right, have a good night, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye.